Welcome to From Betrayal to Breakthrough. I'm Dr. Debbie Silber, and today's guest is Jody Stern of Cohen. Jody is a best selling author, award winning journalist, functional practitioner, and founder of Vibrant Blue Oils, where she's combined her training in nutritional therapy and aromatherapy to create unique proprietary blends of organic and wild crafted essential oils. She's helped over 50,000 clients heal from brain related challenges, including anxiety, insomnia, and autoimmunity. For the past 10 years, She's lectured at wellness centers, conferences, and corporations on brain health, essential oils, stress, and detoxification. She's been seen in the New York Times, Wellness Mama, Elephant Journal, and numerous publications. Her website, Vibrant Blue Oils, is visited by over 300,000 natural health seekers every year. And she's rapidly become a top resource for essential oil education in, on the internet today. And you're about to meet one of the bravest women I know. I'm introducing you to my friend, Jody Cohen, who's healing from what I consider the most painful of the human experiences, losing a child. Betrayal of someone's expectations when they become a parent? Is it betrayal of the life you'd imagined? I don't know what kind of betrayal it is, but Jody's going to share her process that's helping her heal in the most real and authentic way. I know you're going to love her as much as I do. Here's Jody. Okay, everybody, you are in for such a treat. I know I say that every time, but I so mean it. This is one of my dear friends, uh, Jody Cohen. She is so special for so many reasons. And you know, we always talk about betrayal. This is a betrayal we haven't yet spoken about. This is a combination of betrayal of our expectations, betrayal of what we what we thought we'd have and what we didn't have. And, and just what I think is, you know, I talk about how when we're betrayed, it's one of the most painful of the human experiences. And, and we, we tend to say, what's, what could be worse than being betrayed by someone we love? Well, that's, that's losing someone we love and, and especially losing a child. And my dear friend, Jody is here to, um, to, to just talk about this type of betrayal, what it's done to her, for her, her brave, bold way of navigating through it. And, um, and if you or someone you love can, can resonate on any level, this is stop what you're doing. Just stop what you're doing. Grab a pen and paper and maybe some tissues and join us. Welcome my friend, Jody. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Of course, of course. So, you know, betrayal by expectations is very general. You know, it's a it's a general thing. We come into a situation, whether it's a marriage or whether it's being a mom or a dad or even a new business opportunity, and we have a certain set of expectations. And when they go, you know, sideways, uh, we react. Yes. Start to talk to us a little bit about what's uh, what's going on okay. with you. Okay, so. Um, on August 28th, 2018, my ex-husband took my son, Max, who was 12, and three of his friends who were 12 and 13 on a road trip to go whitewater rafting. Uh, they never made it there. He went to pass a semi-truck, and uh, someone had turned in from a side street that he didn't see, and so he went off-road to avoid hitting the car, um, lost control of the vehicle. The vehicle flipped four times. None of the boys were wearing seatbelts. My son, Max, died on impact. Uh, his best friend from preschool died two months later. They had to take him off the feeding tube. And then one of his other friends died four months later. Um, my husband is serving time in prison, but has never really, I mean, what he said to me, he turned out he had marijuana in his system uh, under the legal limit, but still in his system. And he said, boys don't wear seatbelts in my car. And the reason our marriage ended was because he could never, he was bipolar and he could never respect, you know, when I would put them on the gluten dairy free diet, he'd say, let's go to McDonald's. He was constantly undermining me in our marriage. And one of the reasons that I was highly motivated to divorce him was because, because of that. And I wanted to really protect the kids, but for anyone who's been through a divorce, you know, you have a parenting plan. Even if you get full custody, the state thinks it's good for the children to have a relationship with their father. And so he he got to spend two days a week with them. And there had been nothing. I actually, I am not patient. I, I always, you know, had road rage prior to this happening. My ex-husband was bizarrely very patient. Um, you know, part of the reason one of the kids was late and they had an appointment, it, it's not an excuse, but it was highly unusual for him to pass any kind of car. So um, this really surprised me. Uh, 
I live in, you know, a cute little small community that has an interesting mix of people um, who have compassion for me and people who I'm their worst nightmare because, you know, I, I read a book after 9-11. Um, Thomas Friedman, who used to write editorials for the New York Times, wrote this book from Beirut to Jerusalem. And one of the things he talked about was after any kind of tragedy, you almost have to rewire the way you approach the world so that you can feel safe. So you have to say, I'm safe because I walked on this side of the street. The people that died walked on that side of the street. So you almost have to vilify the people that didn't survive in order for you to kind of keep your sense of safety. And so I, I understand that there are people that blame me for the accident, which uh, has been challenging because as a lifelong pleaser, I know I wasn't in the car that day. Every time I was in the car with those kids, we buckled our seatbelts. Every time I was in the car with my ex-husband and those kids, we buckled our seatbelts. I, you know, if I, if I could have changed anything, I would have, I would have liked that. Um, this was 18 months ago. There have definitely been stages of my grief. And we were speaking the other day and you were talking about the people that are stuck and don't heal. And it's the ones that overachieve, which I definitely do. And it's interesting because like I wrote, um, sorry, my nose itches. I wrote a book and I've done all these great things in my business because it gives me a lot of distraction. I can not feel and not deal with the pain when I'm distracted. And yet, you know, my book is turned in. I'm waiting for developmental edits. I live in Seattle. Everything's coronavirus quarantined. All of my distraction has been cut off. It's like my wings have been clipped. And, and you I'm know what? I'm sitting there. Right. And, and it, it's so it brings up and it forces you to, you know, I always say it all the time, face it, feel it, heal it. First of all, I, we could take this conversation in a million different directions. And uh, first, of course, uh, anybody listening is just feeling this with you because it's just, unless you've been there, I imagine you, you can't possibly imagine. I can't possibly imagine. I can only just be there for you as a friend. Um, but I want, you know what, let's start, let's start there because I know with any sort of crisis, it could be like, you know, we talk about betrayal here. And so often, even with something like betrayal, people just don't know how to respond. And so they don't, or they don't show up the way that they need. <sighs> tell, tell me about how your friends were there for you, weren't there for you. What do you notice about friends, your tolerance level? Because everything changes. Everything changes. Yeah. And I'm super lucky. I, I have close friends flying from different continents. Like my best friend, I don't even, the, the unwinding of what happened was um, very slow and painful. A police officer called, they used the word vehicular homicide, which at that point was a new vocabulary word for me. It took a couple hours to even figure out that it was my son that died on the scene. And I was texting some of my friends that live in Chicago, New York, London. And before I even found out, they, they somehow, you know, they, they knew, <laughs> mm. by the way, I was telling the story. They were on a plane that night. I mean, they just showed up. And I think there were people that, um, you know, I was telling you, I, I have a friend who, there's a local restaurant called Bowden Kitchen that makes this amazing beet juice. And I have one friend that would just, text me and say, I'm at Bounty. I'm grabbing you a beet juice. I'm just going to leave it on your front door. Like just doing thoughtful, kind things and especially picking something that I really liked. That was really appreciated. And then there were other people that were um, kind of your tissue issue people, mm -hmm. you know, like- And one explain to people what, because I know we had spoken- about the yeah. tissue issue. And, and uh, I'll just briefly explain my, my definition of it is, is that person who it's, uh, you know, well-intentioned, right? It's if you've ever been in a group and all of a sudden someone breaks down, that's the person who races over. And what happens in a situation like that is it becomes about that person who races over with the tissues and it shunts what the person needs to express and get out of their system. And it also makes it like, it's almost like their confirmation. Yes, you're a, you're a wonderful person. We know that of course you are but it's not about you. So tissue issue people are those, the ones who, yeah, it, it's, it's makes it where it, you're in need, but somehow the attention needs to be on them. Does that sum it up for you too? Yeah. And, and this person was like before, you know, I had a friend flying from London. Uh, you know, all of my friends have kids that they left with their husbands. And this woman's like, Oh my God, I'm doing so much. I've got kids. I've got a life. And they're like, then leave. We're here. You know, we, right. we actually left our children in another state or another continent in some cases. And 
we're not complaining, you know, or this person was gossiping. Like I just read someone, you know, a friend of Vanessa Bryant, just like, she's a broken woman, you know, that kind of thing. Like who goes out there and publicly broadcasts you're a hot mess? Like who that loves you is going to do that when you're kind of in your deepest, darkest hour. It was someone who really liked external validation, really liked the sympathy and Mm -hmm. the kudos that she got from being able to say she was supporting me. But one thing I realized, someone said, sometimes we create our own problems so we can solve them. Mm -hmm. She was starting to meddle in ways and try to manipulate and maneuver me in ways that were so far outside of my comfort zone that then created a problem that she could be the hero to solve. And so I had to to pause that. And one of the things that I've I've been noticing, um, it's very hard for me to have those conversations, those kind of like boundary, you know, this really upset me. And one thing that I've been noticing is that sometimes I'll have that conversation and the friend will be, oh my goodness, I never, you know, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. Someone commented on something, a good friend of mine commented on something that I posted on Facebook professionally Mm -hmm. and kind of said something negative. And they said that was never my intention. They took it down right away. Like that's a very positive interaction. If you can share something that's upsetting and it can be received and actually, you know, improve the friendship, then that's, Mm -hmm. that's great. The challenge comes when you try to be really clear in your boundaries. Like with this woman I started with, you know, can you not call me? Cause my most productive hour, it was really hard for me to get out of bed and get anything done. But if I had Mm -hmm. any shot of doing that at all of the day, Mm -hmm. it was between when my daughter left for school at eight until about 11, when I needed to crash, that's exactly when she'd call. And I'd always say, text me, don't call. Like I tried to put up all these boundaries. She didn't respect any of them. At one point I was having lunch with another mutual friend who had lost a child and she just showed up and sat down and took over the line. I mean, it was so obvious to me. And every time I tried to say like, listen, this, I I can't do this. She, you know, gaslighted, vilified, started um, gossiping to other people and diminishing me. And I just realized, wow, this, this is not something I can sustain. If, if I had given feedback, she'd taken feedback and she'd been able to adjust, that relationship would have been manageable. But clearly her win involves me, you know, being less so that she can feel more. And that was not sustainable. And, and that's what we see when we're, when we're moving through our trauma, our crisis, people become, it's, it's really obvious what we need, what we don't need, need what we've outgrown. Talk to me about the anger. Oh my goodness. I think that that is why I think, you know, it's funny, my daughter and I saw that new Ben Affleck movie, The Way Back, um, Mm -hmm. because, you know, there's nothing we can do. So we went to a movie, not realizing that he lost a child from cancer and that's why he's the alcoholic. Ah. And so there's a certain point where he and the separated wife are at the hospital with other friends and the other friend's child, it becomes clear, is not going to make it. And he's been so clean and so good. And he just goes to the bar and I'm like, that's really interesting. He didn't know how to deal with those feelings. And so he immediately had to suppress them. And I've been suppressing by doing all these other things. And now all my channels for suppression aren't there. And so it's, I almost feel like, you know, if you get one of those um, seltzer bottles, you know, that's in the plastic container and you shake it up, Mm -hmm. it's going to explode, right? That's how I feel. I feel like the shaken up soda can that's going to explode. And what you do is you slowly, you know, open it and release a little bit of pressure. And so I, last night it just, it hit me. I was like, I'm going to explode. I, I don't know how to do this. I don't, this is a brand new skill. This is too much. What will help me? Mm -hmm. And so, um, a friend of mine, Amy Stark, she's um, also in Mindshare. She had told me once that what really helps- And Mindshare, by the way, just for people who don't know, this is an amazing wellness community and we just have brilliant wellness experts in that community. Okay, didn't mean to interrupt. And no, 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 it's super helpful. What she said is that if you can ground yourself, which is I, I have an essential oil that helps you feel grounded, which means kind of shifting into that state of balance. And it- um, it activates, it stimulates your vagus nerve. Your vagus nerve controls the on-off switch between fight or flight where you don't feel safe and rest, digest, and heal where you do feel safe. And I think when you're really angry, you're certainly not in a place of safety. You're feeling very unsafe and you're feeling like you need to fight. I think anger is kind of the fight mechanism of how am I, you know, 
And so just calming that reflux, I just put an oil right here. That mm-hmm. was the first step. And then- And I this is re- audio, so I'm just going to put- she, Jody just went behind her ears. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, if you feel right behind your earlobe, mm-hmm. and you feel that bone, that's your asteroid bone. And that is what- um, you know, it's it's the most accessible point of the vagus nerve on the surface of your skin. And so anything you can do to stimulate that, even if it's just with your fingers rubbing it, um, the oil I like, it's clove, which is super stimulatory, and lime, which has really small molecules. So most things that you put on your skin get into your blood in 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. This gets into your system super quickly. And so it sends a message down your information highway to just calm your body and ground your body. There, there are a lot of exercises. Debbie probably has tons of them. Well, I would love to, I want to know what's worked for you, but when you, so you use the, the grounding oil, you, you rub it on uh, behind, you know, behind your ear and your mastoid bone right there. And you, what's the difference in how you feel? Oh my goodness. It's day and night. Like for anyone who gets hangry, when their blood Mm -hmm. sugar is too low and they have to eat something, the minute you've had four bites, you're a very different person. You're just suddenly calmer. It's easier to be discerning and to recognize, oh, I'm like having road rage in my own body. I have so much anger. I don't know what to do with. And I think, I won't speak for others, but this was the big roadblock for me is that you have all this anger and yet you've been raised to be this really sweet, polite, girl. And so it's almost like I had two, uh, you know, options. I could either be polite and accommodating, secretly seething inside and being so, you know, irritated, or I would blow up Mm -hmm. and there was nothing in between. It was almost like, you know, the, the volume was on mute or it was the highest decibel ever. And so just trying to to navigate that so that you had more options, more speeds than just, you know, super low or super high Mm -hmm. by helping yourself um, kind of center and ground with the oil. And then a friend, um, Amy Stark says, imagine taking a shower in rose petals and just having them almost go through you and just pull out all of your rage and anything that isn't serving you and kind of dropping it in the earth. Mm. my therapist recommended. I love that image. That sounds beautiful. It helps. It helps you kind of release some things. And then my therapist told me, I call it like a mini tornado. She said, imagine your anger is a tornado swirling around. You pick a direction, pick a color, really see it, and then visualize turning it in the other direction so that it peels off of you. Wow. So, so that helped. And then there's this idea that, um, you know, we sometimes get so in our head. And I think when we're in anger, we're really in our head. We're not in our body. We're not in our heart. We're super in our head. So anything that you can do to kind of um, ground yourself, bring yourself back in the body. And uh, sometimes when I don't know what to do, I I pray a little Mm -hmm. bit. I'm like, I just need guidance. I just need help. I, I have no idea what I'm doing or how to navigate this. And often I'll just get an idea. And sometimes the idea will be um, confusing to me. I'm like, mm-hmm. well, you know, it's almost like, wait, what? Are you sure? You know, like, but I really try to surrender and be open and just try it and say like, okay, I'm just going to try that. So the idea that I got was an Epsom salt bath, which um, I love for a number of reasons. You know, Epsom salt is uh, magnesium, which again, gets into your skin and can be very calming. I think it also helps to pull um, things out of you, like uh, physical toxins and also Mm -hmm. sometimes toxic emotions, you know, and just being warm and in the bath, it makes you feel very safe. Mm -hmm. And then what surprised me is I have an oil for boundaries. Mm -hmm. Um, It's called our small intestine oil because the small intestine is the discerning part that decides what you take in or leave out. And I was very drawn to that. And so I put it, sometimes I layer different modalities, like in an Epsom salt bath, I'll put oil sometimes in the bath, but sometimes directly on my body Mm -hmm. because heat uh, makes the oil get into your system quicker. And it it actually does two things. So you're topically applying it. I put it either over my heart for anything emotional or the small intestine and the heat kind of helps it get into the skin faster, makes the skin more absorbable. And then you also smell it. It becomes your own um, 
a very narrow window diffusion system. But I noticed that I immediately felt better, that I immediately felt calmer. And then I just cried my eyes out. It's almost like you have to feel safe to really Mm -hmm. release because I think anger is um, the top layer of fear and sadness. And it's almost like a tough nut to crack. Like once you can kind of get through that anger, then you can get to the core of the issue and you can start to release it and move out of it. That's, that's beautiful. And, and you know, what's so interesting, what I love, I love so many things about you. One of the things that I love about you is that here you are trying to create your own recipe just to help you move through all of this. And everybody's recipe is a, is I guess a bit different, but the, the difference is, and what I see with you is Every time you're you're met with this block or with with some challenge or with just a feeling of being stuck, you look at it in this almost logical, systematic way, saying, "Okay, well, here I'm clearly in this place. This feels terrible." what can I do? And that's, that's why, and I've watched you over the last 18 months and I've seen you being so real and, and so authentic in, in everything you're, you're doing to heal. And it's moving you so much more forward than I think someone who may just say, I'm just checking out. I mean, I just, this is way too much and only opt for the numbing and distractions. And that brings me to post-traumatic growth. And I look at you as someone who is, if there is this trajectory of post-traumatic growth, which is, and and the simplest way I know how to explain it is like the upside of trauma, how that trauma, that crisis led to a new awareness perspective. I look at you and I say, this is what post-traumatic growth looks like. And this is the making of it. Thank you. But you know, it's interesting. Our our mutual colleague, Keisha Erz, told me early on, she's like, post-traumatic growth doesn't last. And as an empath, sometimes when people say things to me, I'm like, that's not true. But what, but, but there are gradients of it that are, what I think was she meant by that, it's almost like when you become a parent, right? And you have no idea what you're doing as a baby. And then you master baby. You're so good at baby. And then they become a toddler and it's all new problems. And you're like, okay, how do I figure out toddler? And then they go to grade school and it's different problems. And then middle school. And it's almost like you're never done. You know, there are all these kind of false peaks. You're hiking. You think you're at the top and you're like, oh, I'm not. And so I think what she meant by that is there's always new learning and new skills and peeling off the onion. And I I really thought I was doing super well because I was feeling mostly pretty good, having way more good days than bad days. And then all of a sudden it was like, I, you know, I got hit in the face, like the door slammed in my face and I'm like, wow, am I like blazing angry? I even was talking to my daughter about it. I'm like, I feel angry all the time. And she's Mm -hmm. like, I never feel angry. I feel anxious, but I don't feel angry. And I'm like, wouldn't that be amazing? Like, what would it be like to wake up in the morning and not be like trying to suppress your rage so you didn't offend anyone? You know, like I, it, like almost. I, I suspect someone said you have problems before you had this problem. I think I've I've always probably been angry, and so just trying to step into that of like I have no idea how to do this but I'm just going to ask for help. Like you've been a huge help. Friends in our community have been a big help. Maybe someone listening has some ideas that I hadn't thought of, Mm -hmm. but I think, I think what happens, I think the reason people get stuck, the reason I certainly get stuck is sometimes when you don't know what to do, you do nothing. Exactly. And And you just get stuck there. Like I've started making, I actually call it my stuck list. Like things, like I'll give you an example. I have some mold in my shower And I actually found a contractor. I found a mold mediation person, but I just don't know what I want to do with the bathroom once we tear it apart and put it back together. So Mm -hmm. I need to find a designer. So once I realized that, I I started asking friends who I think have good taste, do you have a good designer? So it's just, you know, and it's frustrating because sometimes it's three steps forward, two steps back, Mm -hmm. but just stepping into that, like if I can find a designer, that's a great first step. Then, you know, maybe I can move a little bit forward. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm so curious if you were to look at the last 18 months at the, the version of you from back then to where you are now, what have you learned so far? Oh my goodness. Uh, so much. I mean, I think one of the things that I learned is like my son, um, he was that intense kid. He probably had ADD. He was 
a lot. And there were so many things about him that were super amazing, but there were also things about him that were not mainstream. And I think I, I wish I had focused more on the amazing and less on trying, you know, like be quiet, wait your turn, like all the societal norms. You know, I was always trying to fit my little square peg into the round hole. And I don't think I really relished what a square peg he was. And so now I really try to do that. I have, I have a surviving daughter. I really, really try to relish all the good moments and to really notice like when things are good to be really happy that they're good. Like I'm, I'm flying tomorrow and I got upgraded and I love being upgraded because I love having more legroom, especially for long flights. And I'm like, that's really exciting. Like I think I really let myself experience the joy a lot more. And I also have noticed, you know, there are a lot of messy moments in being a mom, right? Moments mm-hmm. when things don't go the way you want. I've really noticed, you know, when uh, my daughter's 15, of course, we're going to have messy moments. I've really tried to kind of see the good in the messy moments and to be grateful for them because um, my son was, our house was super messy when he was alive. And I always focused on like, I want a clean house. And you know what? My house is meticulous now. And I would give anything for that messy house and my son back. Yeah. I've also tried to be really um, forgiving with myself. You know, like I, uh, one of the things that I've noticed as I heal is that sometimes I need to do harder things. Like, you know, when someone starts to diet, you can just take them off gluten and dairy and they lose weight to a certain point. And then you need to maybe add in more exercise or certain supplements. You just, you have to keep upping the bar. And so I'm doing this hard class. I'm easily the oldest person in the class by at least 10 years. And there are days when it's just so hard that I just have to lay in child's pose for a minute. And I just let myself take those breaks. I, I like say, you know what, just being here is enough. If, mm. if I just do, you know, this plank for however long she's holding it, which feels like way too long, that's enough. If I need to go down on my knees, that's, you know, like I just give myself grace and give myself space and, and know that there are some days like it was my son's birthday the other day. And I stayed in my pajamas for half the day and I just gave myself permission to do that. Yeah. I, I, I love that because it's just, it's just so real. What are some things that have really helped? I know the oils have helped. Are there any other modalities, strategies, tools that, that you said, okay, you know what, when I tried that, that did help to some extent. You know, the best advice, I had been in therapy through the divorce, and then I I thought I graduated, (laughs) and I called her right the day it happened, and she basically gave me her lunch that next day, and what she said is, all you need to do is eat, sleep, and move, and I loved that because as a practitioner who, you know, and also a a patient, you know, there have been times when people have given me 20 things to do, and it almost made my head spin. It was Mm -hmm. way too much, Mm -hmm. so sometimes I think less is more. And when you really get into eat, sleep, move, you know, eating um, the the oil that I mentioned earlier, the parasympathetic oil, that helps you shift into the state where your blood is being routed to your stomach and your intestines and all Mm -hmm. these things as opposed to uh, your arms and legs so you can run fast. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, eating is how we get our nutrients. Eating is how you sustain your health. Sometimes when we're, we're really stressed, we, we just can't eat or we eat everything. So just being really um, conscious of making sure there were things I could eat. And early, early on, nothing tasted good. There was one salad from that restaurant, Bounty Kitchen, that mm-hmm. that was all I could bring myself to eat. And so mm-hmm. that's what I ate for mm-hmm. an entire month. But I ate. Yeah. Sleeping. Sleeping is really when we regenerate and when we heal. And I knew how critical that was. I don't do very well with pharmaceutical drugs. So what I used instead was um, oils. I have a circadian rhythm oil that helps release melatonin. I have a sleep oil that's relaxing. And then I I actually used melatonin, liposomal melatonin under the tongue. And I live in Washington state where marijuana is legal. And there is this true blue CBD oil that truly like knocks you out like nothing I've ever seen. But mm. I was okay with that because I knew that if I didn't sleep and I wasn't well rested, that would really throw me off. And then moving is so underrated. You know, it not it, it gets oxygen in your system. It moves your lymphatic system. If all you can do is, I have a dog, so I, it, it's almost like forced movement. But 
I really felt like just getting out every day and walking the dog, even if it, you know, we're in Seattle is pouring rain. Mm -hmm. There's something about that. I think that moving moves energy too. Mm -hmm. So those, those were the things that, and they still, I mean, early on when I could really barely juggle three things, that's what got me through. But every day, you know, I think it's really important. I really make sure that I'm trying to eat some nutritious food that Mm -hmm. I get a good night's sleep and that I do something to move my body. And I imagine some days that when you do those three, that's a, that's a home run of a day. What do you want to make sure everybody knows as we wrap up? I want to make sure everybody knows that they're not alone, that, that there is no shame. This is not something they chose. And that if that, that there are periods that will be better, that this is not forever and that it's fluid and you'll move through things and that there, there are going to be moments of clarity and, and relief when you realize, Oh goodness, you know, that this horrible, horrible thing happened. And yet look at in kind of um, baptism by fire, having to walk through this incredible amount of pain. I am learning things that I can now carry with me and I, you know, I can be happier. I can let go of my anger. Like it's possible that I don't need to feel angry every day. And how amazing would that be? And how much energy would that open up for me to feel joy, to feel compassion, to, you know, all the things that I, I do feel, I'm not just a, you know, a raging ball of anger, but um, I'd like to have more space to feel that way. You know, Jody, and I'm sure everybody listening You are truly one of my heroes. You are one of the bravest women I know. I just, I see so much strength in your vulnerability, in who you are, in the road you're traveling, really with a topic that no one ever wants to deal with, but you're, you're, you're facing it head on. And, and that's why I think you're, you're moving through this the way you are just in a real authentic and, and such a beautiful way. I just want to thank you so much, my dear friend. Thank you. You helped so many people today. Thank you. I could have kept that conversation going for hours. There's so much to gain from what Jody shared, from losing patience with people who have the tissue issue to the anger that erupts to the many layers of healing that continue to take place. Stay in touch with Jody by going to vibrantblueoils.com and we'll have all of her information in the show notes at pbtinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Here's my biggest takeaway. Healing isn't a straight and smooth path. Whether that's healing from betrayal or healing from any loss, it's the moment by moment, day by day commitment to keep trying that matters most. It's the realization that some days will be easier than others. And on those tough days, giving yourself a break and some self-love is the best medicine. As Jody said, eat, sleep, and move. Those are great places to start. She also learned so much, like focusing on what's different and quirky versus trying to fit into a mold, seeing the good in the messy moments, forgiving yourself, and giving yourself some space and some grace. And betrayal, like any life crisis, hits us hard. So it's important to do what you can to move towards healing. Of course, to see if your betrayal and what it left in its wake, take the post-betrayal syndrome quiz at pbtinstitute.com forward slash quiz. And the PBT Institute membership community is coming. Imagine everything you'd ever need to become your physical, mental, emotional best. Community, support, certified coaches and practitioners. You can schedule time with daily classes on all kinds of interesting topics, curated experts, teaching advanced strategies in the areas of health and mindset, spirituality, personal development. Imagine the most exciting, warm and friendly, welcoming and supportive place to become your best all online. I'm so excited to welcome you to it. It's the pbtinstitute.com forward slash join. Just go there to learn more. Thanks for listening. I can't wait to be with you next time. And here's to your breakthrough. Breakthrough.